Okay. Deb will continue to let people in as they as they arrive, but um, otherwise, I have a uh, short PowerPoint presentation just to give you some um, some images of of what uh, what I'm talking about, what our team is working on, things that that are are coming up in our near future, and and then there should be plenty of time for questions that you have about the museum and what we're up to. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and get this going. Uh, huh. Okay. And I, um, when a Zoom is in this mode, I usually minimize the um, the pictures on the side. If If you know you can do that, you can kind of shrink <coughs> how many faces you see. Uh, to either a few faces, one face, or no face. So, so that might help you see more of what's on the PowerPoint slides. But uh, the purpose of, of this evening is just to give you a little update on what we're up to here at the Museum of Danish America as of November 2023. Um, uh, for some of you who are current board members, uh, some of these updates will be familiar from our October board meeting. Uh, but this is a chance just to share that information and and uh, a little more current information as well uh, with with all of you. This this year has been uh, really consumed with our 40th anniversary. And if you didn't know it was our 40th anniversary, where have you been? <laughs> well, this has been uh, this has been our major um, effort, uh, a lot of outreach, a lot of publications, and a lot of events. Um, from since beginning our kind of series of celebration events uh, last September in New York, we have had 40th anniversary events in 13 different communities um, around the country and in Denmark. Um, and it's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, to uh, connect with longtime museum friends, um, more recent museum members, and people who are really just learning about us, um, people who came along at the invitation of their neighbors or friends. And, um, and at all of these events, we've had a nice mix of familiar faces and new faces, and that's been that's been a really wonderful uh, outcome of this year. We've been able to have events in a lot of exciting different spaces. Um, uh, the photograph in the middle there is the Milwaukee Art Museum, this beautiful art architectural space right on the shore of Lake Michigan. And we had our own private reception there. Um, and so that was that was a really unique, uh, unique opportunity. We've also met in private homes. On the on the left is the home of, of our board member Mindy Brown and her hus husband Rich Inman um, in Little. Littleton, Colorado. And so they they hosted a luncheon there. All of these events have been just wonderful gatherings uh, for a chance to, to meet with museum staff, learn about what we do, and just visit with, with uh, people in, in your communities. So hopefully you've been able to attend one or more of these yourselves. And, uh, and it's been a great way to, to mark this milestone anniversary. And I know many of you were here in Elkhorn at our big Elkhorn party, um, and we threw a lot into our June celebration. We co-hosted a three-day conference with the Danish American Heritage Society called Ecologies and Ethnicity. Um, so 100 guests attended that. We had 250 for a tent dinner on the lawn. And then another 150 people came after the dinner to watch um, our local youth theater camp uh, perform The Ugly Duckling um, in the tent. And so uh, all of that just spun into our annual um, Sankt Hansoften uh, Midsummer Celebration. It was really a, a wonderful weekend of events and a lot of people were able to participate, which was which was great. Alongside the outreach part of the 40th anniversary, we've also been running our 40th anniversary campaign. Um, and since launching that officially in October 21, um, we've raised over $1.3 million. Um, 825,000 of that has gone directly to grow the, our endowment. 
And a, a very recent activity um, under the auspices of the campaign, um, I'm very pleased to announce that we have received a naming gift to create the Ronald D. and Mary L. Bro Prairie Internship as a named endowment uh, for the museum. And so Ron Bro was a former board member, instrumental in helping to bring the Jen Dixon cabin to the grounds of the museum. And both he and Mary were lifelong educators and passionate about the museum. So we are really thrilled that their legacy will live on um, in this named internship. The internship program has been around for a few years. Every summer, we've hired a summer internship to specifically gain hands-on experience in managing our prairie park. And now they will be called the Bro Prairie Intern. One thing to keep in mind for certainly for someone in my my uh, position is that campaign donations are not the same as operating cash or the money we can use to do the mundane necessary things like paying the electric bill. <laughs> And so I put together this for our board meeting, and I thought I would share it with you all today. Where do we get the cash to just pay the bills that come every year? And I'm going to sound like you know a public broadcasting statement statement right now, but that biggest orange chunk of the pie, that is direct contributions from our members and donors. And um, that is memberships, that is contributions to our appeal letters, that is um, uh, just the uh, the gifts that we receive um, without, uh, that are that are not tied to a specific project. So so that that is the largest wedge of our of our revenue pie. The the kind of lighter blue um, above it that is cash withdrawals from our endowment. And so you can see that that our endowment really provides a pretty significant uh, contribution to just the cash that we can spend on on regular operations. Um, the the darker blue are restricted donations. So donations that come in specifically for projects. And those projects might happen in the same year that the contribution is made, or they may um, uh, be contributions that are held in a special designated account, and we spend it as the expenses for those projects come due. And that could be over a course of, of many years. So these other wedges of the pie, um, the brown are for grants where we apply for money. Sometimes those are competitive grants and there are specific um, expectations for reporting and spending that money. And the gray section is the one that we have no control over. <laughs> the gray section are bequests and memorials. And so again, that's a relatively significant chunk of our revenue pie. Um, and, um, and it's completely dependent on, you know, who passes away in a given year and, and whether the museum is part of their planned giving um, or not. And so, uh, so that's, that's the, that's the section of our revenue pie that, that is the least predictable. Ideally, what we would like to see is that blue wedge of um, endowment support continue to grow so that we no longer have to include a dependency on bequests and memorials to meet our operating need. And so uh, over time, we really want to continue to grow the endowment and you know, lessen that, that wedge of, of bequest, uh, yeah. bequest gifts that, that we have to depend on. We still want to encourage planned giving, um, but uh, but uh, allow ourselves to to use those gifts uh, for for special project or increased endowment growth, and not um, paying light bills. So one of the things that we are are learning more about um, in the last few months are would be another tool for um, you know increasing our menu of of donation and planned giving options, and that is charitable gift annuities. Um, this is a system by which a donor makes a large upfront gift to a charity, and then the donor receives annual cash payments. 
um, through the rest of their lifetime. It's a fixed amount and they will get that every year for the rest of their life. The charity then gets whatever is left in that fund at the time of the donor's death. And so that could be, um, it, that's entirely dependent on the lifetime of the donor. Um, and this is this is something that's been in place for you know decades and decades, and usually is something that um, that larger uh, nonprofits are able to manage. You may see pages like this in maybe an alumni magazine or another publication by major charities. These are two that I get in the mail from my college and from the Nature Conservancy. And where you see kind of these tables of depending on your age, you could get this type of annual um, annual payment uh, in an annuity form uh, for the rest of your life. For the charity, this takes a lot of management on the back end. And so it really hasn't been something that was attainable for a museum our size. But we have been um, in communication with a group that was founded just over about a decade ago, the National Gift Annuity Foundation. And they basically set up for the purpose of making charitable gift annuities possible for a wide range of charities. They serve as the charity that that kind of takes that initial gift, manages the investment of it, manages the annual payments, you know, figures out the calculations of how much of that gift is tax deductible and how much of it is not. Um, and then when that donor passes away, the National Gift Annuity Foundation sends a check for whatever is left over to the named charity. So in this case, you know, our museum. So, so we're in conversation with the National Gift Annuity Foundation to learn more about the nuts and bolts of how this would work for us, how we can make this uh, one of our options for our donors. And we hope to have that in place you know, by the end of this year. So if it's something that you want to learn more about, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because um, we are actively learning more, educating ourselves so that we can add this to our menu of options. I wanted to make sure that for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet our current interns in person, um, maybe you've met them at, at some outreach events or at the board meeting, maybe you'll meet them at upcoming events. We have two Danish interns right now. Marius Bopolsen, um is interning at the Genealogy and Education Center, and Sven Boos is interning with the Curatorial Department. And in fact, he will be giving our brown bag lunch uh, tomorrow on the topic of Danish immigration to to Argentina, which is his own family background. So we'll be learning more about that, uh, that different um, Danish migration history. So um, as, as was mentioned a little bit earlier, we will be recording Sven's presentation tomorrow. Um, and after a little bit of editing, it will be available on our YouTube channel for viewing at your convenience. Our other uh, news of our team is Dia Nagaraj, who has been the Albert Ravenholt Curator of Danish American Culture. She has accepted an opportunity to join the staff of the American Alliance of Museums. She will be a program officer for the Museum Assessment Program, which sadly means that she will no longer be the Albert Ravenholt Curator of Danish American Culture. Um, she has brought so much to this role, and we are simultaneously thrilled for and proud of her for this new opportunity um but but also sad to see her go and uh and you know hoping that we can find someone who can fill this position with uh with as much of a range of talent as dia has brought to it So right now we are actively seeking um, applications for um, the Albert Ravenholt Curator of Danish American Culture. We are also accepting applications for an archives intern to begin in January, 2024. And I'll discuss that in just a moment. And then we will also um, in the first couple months of the new year, be advertising for applications for the Bro Prairie intern, uh, which is a summer position. And that person generally begins um, um, in mid to late May, depending on their academic schedule. 
The archives, in turn, will be working specifically with the Danish Sisterhood Archival Collection. Um, and this is a project that is being financially supported by individuals and lodges of the Danish Sisterhood of America. Um, this is kind of step two of working with the Sisterhood Collection. Um, it's all been cataloged and sorted and boxed and stored properly. But now we want to take the most... Um, uh, kind of research uh, rare, unique parts of that collection, digitize them and make them available online for, for anyone to search and, um, and read and, and just really use, use this collection. And so it's a process of taking um, handwritten ledgers, you know, individual ledgers kept by the secretaries of all these lodges across the country scanning them with uh, with a specialized rented book scanner, and then putting them on the platform that already exists for Danish American newspapers, we will expand that platform to include uh, the Danish um, Danish Sisterhood online library. And our top priorities are our collection of over 300 handwritten ledgers, and also the whole history of the um, Danish Sisterhood news and newsletters that go out every month. So the intern, the archives intern, uh, will be here for six months and with the responsibility of physically working with the collection, doing the scans and preparing those files for uploading to the online library. Also coming soon, this is a picture I took yesterday of a work in progress in the gallery. Um, uh, our next exhibition in the main floor gallery is called Fabric of a Nation, Art Quilts and Immigration Stories. And we're blending um, uh, art quilts um, and, and uh, 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 textile traditions that represent three different migration stories. Um, one group of, of pieces are uh, quilts from our own collection, um, from Danish American communities or individuals or groups. Another group of, of objects on display are Hmong story cloths, which depict the culture and the history of, of that particular community um, who largely left uh, Southeast Asia as refugees in the 1970s and early 80s. And then we have more contemporary art quilts that have been created by different arts art, art quilters um, uh, and a part of the Migrant Quilt Project in Arizona. And they are looking at how to commemorate those people who have attempted to migrate to the United States across the southern border, um, but have have perished in that process. And so these quilts are really looking at the the individuals and and the specific you know kind of human face and names behind those who have who have died in the attempt. So it's a it's a wide ranging exhibition and um, a really fascinating way to compare how these different migration stories can be represented in fiber traditions. That exhibit will open in time for Yule Fest. Our annual Yule Fest in the Danish villages is always the Friday and Saturday after Thanksgiving. And so it involves our museum sites, the genealogy and education center, and all of the businesses and restaurants um, uh, throughout Elkhorn and, and sites in Kimbleton as well. And so this really is the, the community um, holiday celebration. Uh, so we, we kick off right right into holidays right after Thanksgiving um, and uh, at the at the museum we're all sparkly and have plenty of new things to share uh, in the shop it's a big shopping day for for us and for our visitors we have live music um, Sven uh, has brought his trumpet along during his internship and so we'll be having trumpet and piano duets for some piano music or for live music so if you're in the area um, come on by for Yule Fest it's always fun Tova, who's the other half of the duet? Oh, I'm the other half of the duet. <laughs> yes, I'm the piano to yes. Spence yeah. trumpet. It's lovely. <laughs> and we actually rehearsed last night. So, <laughs> so we're not entirely winging it. Um, looking ahead into 2024, uh, we 
our our goal for the next year is really to keep the momentum going on some really wonderful things that you know that were that started or grew in in 2023. Um, Alyssa Lacan, who is now full time as of uh, this spring as youth and community educator, she has been able to develop a whole new range of programs for audiences of all ages. The Spark program is. Um, uh, we are one museum of a consortium of many museums across the Midwest who are offering monthly programs specifically designed uh, to serve uh, people with early to mid-stage memory loss and their care partners. And so um, that is happening here at the museum every month of uh, an immersive multi-sensory experience, you know, in a supportive uh, environment for, um, for this audience. Um, youth summer camps were are the other you know brand new initiative that Alyssa has been developing and then will be building into 2024. Um, the picture here on the right is that ugly duckling performance that took place under the tent uh, at our 40th anniversary, and that was a full five days of the students learning their parts, practicing, and and finally performing on the Saturday. But there were also several day camps throughout the summer on different topics and. So, you know, taking what we learned this summer and and building into 2024 is is uh, is is a really exciting um, growth opportunity for us. And we continue to want to take what we learned from our outreach events also in 2023 and apply them to 2024. Not quite as many, perhaps, as, as our 40th anniversary year, but we already know that there will be events in Minneapolis, in Chicago, in Houston, and that staff will be attending events in um, Cleveland, Ohio, and Seattle, Washington. And this is just a, a start, you know, we're um, you know, we'll be filling in both the map and the schedule in the in the next couple months so that we can really keep um, keep you all and and our national audience um, informed with with ample time to to plan to attend some of these special opportunities. Another initiative that is um, uh, really building off of our anniversary year, one of the projects that our anniversary campaign is is supporting um, financially and and uh, with with uh, specific donations is the growth of our Danish ceramics collection and the development of an exhibition of Danish ceramics to open basically one year from, from now. And so we have been um, making some strategic acquisitions, sometimes strategic purchases, all three items you see here are um, are now part of our collection or soon will be. Um, some of them are in private collections. Some of them have been on auctions. Um, and it's everything from on the left, uh, uh, early Bjorn Vinblad. Um, I know it doesn't look like his whimsical smiley faces, but from his early ceramic days when he was decorating with uh, with cow horn. So that's why the the decorations look kind of globby and thick. <laughs> but that was that was the style he was working with. In the middle, this beautiful blue pitcher, it's called the split pitcher made by the Saxbo Pottery Studio designed by Eva Store Nelson. And on the right is a very early Royal Copenhagen chocolate cup, this lidded cup um, that is uh, from the maybe 1780s. Um, and so the just a darling, delicate little thing, not what you expect, uh, maybe if you think of only blue and white of ceramics, which is, which is why we are calling our exhibition of next year, Danish Ceramics Beyond Blue and White. And all three of these items will be included in that exhibition. And I have some very uh, new news. Um, just yesterday, we received word that our application to the new Carlsberg Foundation in Denmark was approved. 
And we had requested these eight items from the foundation's own collection. They go out and they buy art from Danish artists and they their purpose is to place Danish artists in museum collections around the world. So as a museum, we were able to make an application, um, look through their online inventory of what they have in their collection and basically just ask them for art and make the case of why why we feel we could be a good home for them. Just yesterday, we received the news that, yes, they are going to donate to us all eight of these items, contemporary artists, some very well known on the global stage. We're really excited about this. And, and again, all of these pieces will also be part of that exhibition to open next year. Danish ceramics beyond blue and white. So that's the quick overview of, of what's keeping us busy. I'm sure there are other things, but um, but that's that's what uh, what I wanted to be sure to to share with all of you. And I'm going to close this screen here so we can see each other again. And I welcome whatever questions you might have and it's probably best if you raise a hand maybe if there's too many people talking it's hard to sort out on zoom yes Anne. when does dia leave us dia leaves us right after yule fest so um, she she has been working to um, complete the installation of the Fabric of a Nation exhibition, and so that will go up. Um, and uh, and she's been um, she's been very active in in helping us put the um, kind of the transition in place so that we don't lose momentum on the Danish ceramic exhibition. Um, so uh, so yeah, so week and a half, week and a half, yeah. Um, Gary or Sherry, I think I saw a hand with you. Sorry, yeah. you're, you're muted. Did Deb mute them? I don't know. You <laughs> should be able to unmute. Is that better? Yes, there yep. you are. Yeah. This is uh, not a question, but a comment. Uh, the hiring of Alyssa Lacan, I think that was a great move for the museum. Uh, she really did a lot of nice things and is very forward looking. Yeah, we're we're so uh, we're so glad that she's she's joined our museum team. Um, I I know there there may be some locals who begrudge begrudge us for stealing her from the library. <laughs> but uh but 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 we can take it um but yeah no she's we we knew that the quality of her work and creativity and dedication um would would be a huge asset and and that has certainly proved to be the case okay someone has a television on in the background again <laughs> All right, thank you. Can I ask another question or a question? Of course. Well, have you closed the uh, campaign on the 40th anniversary uh, donation? No, the, the um, campaign lasts through December 31st of this year. And so any gift or pledge made by December 31st will count towards the campaign. Um, then pledges have an extra two years to be paid in full. So so we we could still be receiving campaign funds until the end of 2025. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Niels. You need to unmute too, Niels. I'm a quiet speaker. <laughs> I saw your source of income. How is your financials? How are you doing? We're, you know, we're doing pretty well. Um, we have no debt. 
Um, and so that's that's good. We have um, we have been drawing on our cash reserves. And so, uh, you know, that, that's the that's we we would rather not have to do that of course <laughs> um but um uh, but we are um we're in a we're in a pretty solid position um for for the for kind of meeting our meeting our needs in the coming months um but uh but this is where our uh chronic dependency on on bequest revenue becomes that unknown of of you know whether we can you know fully meet our financial needs um because bequests are are coming in or or if we have to continue to draw down on our cash reserves tova as always your presentation was most informative i i did welcome your comments uh regarding the endowment and the importance of growing it i think mm -hmm. that most important for the future of the museum. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the endowment is is really one of our most reliable um you know sources of of you know spendable uh asset, you know, because we have set up a you know a a, a three year average um to and and a fixed percentage to to anticipate you know what we can spend from that endowment every year and and that that has made a significant difference in being able to to plan um you know and and kind of figure out how how to meet our our budget needs uh without being completely at the whim of of stock markets going up and down so we're able to um to balance that out um over a longer time frame. Right. Hey, Tova, mm -hmm. it's Eric. Yeah. Would you would you talk a little bit about about uh, and this is yeah, I'm the last person who should be asking this question. You're the person who knows about. So what's the philosophy behind um, beyond blue and white? What how do you frame an exhibit about you know, Danish porcelain, this is such a wide, wonderful world. How do you focus? Um, the so so I would I would say within the title, there's kind of two two assumptions that that we need to, you know, full fill out within that gallery. Um, for those people who have a familiarity with Danish ceramics, most people are going to be both most familiar with blue and white the blue and white christmas plates blue and white other collectibles blue and white dinnerware whether it's royal copenhagen blue lace or bing and grendel seagull um you know it's the it's the blue and white um mass produced um pieces that have been most widely collected displayed um throughout danish america and so that's for for our kind of established audience that's that's a starting point and so for for that audience we need to both explain why blue and white has been so dominant um you know what are the historical and technical and artistic reasons behind that and then introduce you know the the true wider world of you know uh, artistic expressions and you know technological innovations um the the variety within the pieces built for the marketplace and and the um you know the the contemporary artists that are that are doing some just jaw dropping uh works so so it's um in in that sense it's a it's a survey of 250 years of Danish ceramic production um, that that we aim to to have it serve both as an introduction to people for whom this is brand new information, but also for folks who who have that more um, I would say kind of a uh, uh, familiar kind of Danish American familiarity with with the um, Christmas plates and tablewares um, that there is much more beyond that. Um, so, so we hope to be able to uh, to kind of reach people at at both of those levels. That's a hugely ambitious project. 
How many? Yeah, how many that's never stopped us, Eric. <laughs> how many? How many pieces will be? Are you aiming for in this? We the artifact list currently is um, in the mid fifties, um, and we actually had a meeting with uh, an exhibit design firm this morning um, to kind of bring them on. They had helped. They helped us with the new Nordic cuisine exhibit, and so we've invited them to um, to be part of the exhibit team for this as well. And their initial suggestion was that we we actually add a few more blue and white, <laughs> so that we can you know really kind of establish that um that paradigm right from the beginning so so the full artifact list might be more like 60 to 65 that's a lot of shorthand i mean you're telling a huge story in a really condensed format yeah but we yeah. also only have about 1500 square feet to do it in yeah oh no i get yeah. it I yeah get it. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. And it's and and I think we we also see this as um you know as a uh of you know setting our flag out to say like hey you know we we are becoming a, a museum that both has these collections you know is is a resource for for this type of understanding um, Danish ceramics is not a specialty of any other museum that we've come across in, in, in this nation, there are collections that have some really nice pieces and we are um, are seeking to borrow some of them for this exhibition. But but no one has says had said, you know, this is what we really want to focus on. And so there's a really unique opportunity for our museum to um, to be active in that space. And and then, you know, in over the coming years to be able to follow up with more um, focused exhibitions on, you know, specific studios. Um, for example, uh, the Pulsehus studio was active for uh, about 25 years. I'm going to be looking at Dia's face and she can nod or, or say, no, that's totally wrong. Um, it was founded by a husband and wife um, team. And they, they started, they were one of these um, mid-century modern stoneware uh, um, studios. And their... Um, their children still have a lot of the um, the pieces from the last years of production. They still have a lot of the uh, the records of the studio, and they're beginning to work with a Danish curator to create an exhibition in Denmark specifically about the Palshus story. In the same way that years ago we were able to basically you know, work with a Danish museum that had done a standalone Bjorn Wiedblad exhibition, this might be an opportunity for us to be kind of the American partner in how we share that Paul's Who's story to an American audience. And so um, putting ourselves in this space and and getting to know the the people who are very active, whether in collecting or researching or exhibitioning, um, uh this this world um i think i think opens up opportunities uh for us for you know for the foreseeable future thank you tova wasn't there a collection that you were interested in oh a year or two ago uh, a gentleman that had a large collection that what, was the museum interested in acquiring that collection at one point? It was never quite clear to me. Yes, we were. Um, this this whole um kind of reimagining us as a as a center for Danish ceramics really started with our our work with that one collector in Michigan, a private collector. And we did have a lot of conversations with him. Um, he was interested in finding a home for his collection. We were not able to take the entire collection. And, and as we got closer to saying, well, we've, we're have we opening an exhibit in November, 2024. And so we really need to know our, you know, this list of things that we would like, are you, are you able to commit to those? He was not ready to commit to those <laughs> so you know so the the timing the wasn't 
wasn't working. Um, and so, you know, that that conversation is on hold, but in the process, um, you know, there are other collectors with different focuses. And so we've been having conversations with a lot of different um, different people. Uh, you know, there's a, a museum member in California who has a phenomenal collection of Bjorn Wienblad pieces and is is ready to actively disperse. And so that's where that horn painted um, bowl will be coming from. And um, and we um, we came across a collector in Colorado whose focus is mid-century stoneware, 20th century Danish stoneware, he was the one who introduced us to the the family, the the heirs of the Palsus studio. Uh, so so we've we've been kind of following different leads uh, wherever they go and have been have been discovering some really wonderful resources. So I think um, well, the the vision for um, for becoming a, a national resource for Danish ceramics did start with our our conversations with that one collector, um, we have been able to build a wider range of connections that can help us achieve um, maybe not the same goal in the same time frame, but still working in that same direction. But these items would not have been donations. We would have had to acquire them monetarily. Right. Um, that the the suggestion was that the collector in Michigan was going to donate them, um, but uh, but but we wanted to make sure that the donation included the really good stuff and not just the stuff he needed to get rid of. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so our needs were not quite aligning <laughs> at at this time. That, that's kind of what I assumed, but I didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Any questions from folks on the phones? <laughs> You don't have to turn your video on to ask a question. We'll just say that. But you would have to unmute. So we'll just watch to see if anyone unmutes. But it's so nice to see our friends on these uh, videos. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Yeah. It was really exciting to get the um, the Christmas catalog there. Um Yesterday, yesterday, today, I can't remember, one of the two, anyway. Um, and there's some great items in there. Are we ex sort of expanding? You can't expand the footprint. It's full already. <laughs> but are we are are these introducing new lines we haven't had before or expanding lines we've already been carrying? Nan, you can take that one. We uh, have got a couple of different new lines, but most of them are just um, different, a variety of things from vendors that I've bought from in the past. I've expanded a lot in the books and um, just trying to s stick with the Scandinavian theme and, and not veer off path. But um, yeah, the catalog is a lot of work. I'm glad it's out there. And we've been getting orders continuously since it's been hitting the mailboxes. So. It's been good. It was a fifteen hundred dollar day today, so a lot of them were just phone orders or catalog online. Yeah. We know things get really busy in the store when the folding tables start coming down the hallway to arrange all of the different shipments and getting all the orders lined up. <laughs> so that's how that's how the rest of us gauge uh, <laughs> busy busy shopping periods. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Knudsen family. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we sure do miss having a motel to stay in when we come to Elkhorn. I understand the city now owns the hotel or motel. Mm -hmm. sure any word about that as what they're going to do with it? Or I, I haven't heard anything, you know, definitive. Um, Terry, do you 
what's the last what's the latest um the last i'd heard or read I, on the city's facebook page of the last city council meeting um they've been doing some cleanup there there's some people interested but there's also a representative from dollar general that's that's mm -hmm. been coming to the city council meeting so i don't know if they're making any headway i know that the city's been after dollar general or something like that to come into the community and I don't know if they would purchase the hotel and tear it down, or there's also that land south of the hotel. I think Marnie Elkhorn Telephone Company owns that property. So nothing concrete other than it's under the ownership of the city. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. And it's in really rough shape. Yeah, yeah. In inside as well as outside, Terry. Yeah, there was. Uh, I think about a year ago, a year and a half ago, there the city was losing thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of water, and they couldn't figure out where the leak was. And they finally discovered it was backing up into the, the pool. Oh my! Yeah, and the the owners. I think it was still under. It was still owned by whatever the guy's name is, and uh, yeah, it just. It, it, it was just a mess. Yeah. And of course, you know, it hasn't been kept up or cleaned or maintained. So. No. Yeah. It, it was so lovely when it was opened up, when we stayed there the first few years, it was so well maintained. I remember flowers in our room when we got, you know, registered, it, it was so well done. And, and it, it's so important for the museum and for the community to, as you say, to have a motel there in Elkhorn. There are new, two new Airbnbs that have opened up. They're, they're small, but you know it's two places to stay. One is above Larson's pub. Um, it's like a little step up behind them. And then um, there's a new little retail store that's opened up called Love You More. And it's an upstairs, or they they own the whole building, and on the main the main floor there's a like a one one bedroom Airbnb. Oh, mm -hmm. not a lot of rooms, but it's you know it, it helps. No, and then Trudy Jules Guard runs a, a B and B, and one morning of your stay, she will feed you an Abel Skeever breakfast. <laughs> I've never done that one. <laughs> Delicious. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody um we don't need to you know keep on just to stare at each other in silence but uh <laughs> we're we're coming up close to the hour mark um it's lovely to see all your faces representing every time zone of the continental u.s uh and um and you know of course if if you have if you have some questions that are that occur to you later please don't hesitate to to reach out by by email and we'll be glad to to um give our answers as best we can i would just uh send dia off with our best regards she knows she has a danish family all over the country right mm -hmm. and uh nan i just want to say that the catalog that you compile is one of the classiest catalogs we receive. <laughs> and right now we're receiving about four or five catalogs every day. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, Marilyn, wait till you get the one from the egg crate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Well, I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Just it, don't hold your breath. It, it took years before we ever knew about the egg crate, but I must say it was 
a unique experience, something that I had absolutely never seen anything like it before. We always stop and buy uh, jams, a collection of jams and jellies. Uh, a lady, apparently, she always stocks them there, and they're very, very good. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to do this. Uh, it's, it's helpful. Yeah, Thank well, great. Yeah, glad glad that all of you could join us tonight. So that's it's great to see you all. Keep up the good work. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Sherry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Tolba, for all you do. Yeah, thanks for all your efforts. Yeah, all thank you. Harry and all of Nan and oh. Thank you yep. all. A museum. Thanks, Lisa. I, I must say a museum is far more than just a building. It's it's you people that are have been there for so many years that have made the museum. And we are most appreciative of your efforts. Thank yeah. you, Lowell. Thank you, Lowell. And and for those of you who don't recognize, I'm sorry I should have done this earlier, but there are several museum staff members joining us on this on this call. Cheyenne Yen's daughter Northquist and Phil Wernsman and Dia is is with us and Nan and Deb and Terry and uh Tim Palmer is hiding down there with his video off. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh but yeah no we've we've got a really wonderful team um and we we keep ourselves very busy but uh um but we we also had a great potluck today kind of in in honor of Dia and conversations at tables ranged from um Nan's experience with a rabid skunk in her farmyard to uh to our intern Marius singing Vietnamese karaoke. So <laughs> it was, you know, it was just, you know, a nice, nice opportunity to just yeah. sit down with a huge, delicious meal that we all participated in. So yeah. and I should mention too, our intern Marius is leaving Friday for a trip to New York to visit some friends that are interning there. And then also Washington, DC. He has a friend that's interning at the embassy. So he'll be able to meet the ambassador and also the prince who is now in Washington, DC. So he's very excited about that. He wants to pursue a, a career as a diplomat. Mm. I thought yeah. Prince died. Which <laughs> prince? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they have more. <laughs> this is the Danish prince, Eric. <laughs> Not the Minneapolis prince. <laughs> yeah. Prince Prince Joachim. Yeah. Yeah. Younger brother of the Crown Prince Philip. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But he's his his friends in New York are interning at the UN, so also pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But he also said he's very happy to be at the museum and he feels so lucky because um, his friends who are interning specifically at the UN don't receive any pay and have to pay for their own housing while they're there. And um, that would be really rough for um, in New York, especially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, and he just feels that he is uh, having such a great opportunity to meet people in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in small town America. So. And he went to Omaha to go shopping for new clothes for this special <laughs> visit. <laughs> and there's his roommate right there, Sven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>